we know from like a biological perspective that in times of low calorie, men would lean up and get fitter and stronger to go fight the beast to try to bring calories home. But women would get fatter and their menstrual cycle would stop because they needed to store calories and they couldn't reproduce because why would you reproduce when there aren't enough calories around to feed who was already there? Intermittent fasting, carnivore diet, vegan diet, people get so wedded to a particular di dietary approach or nutritional strategy. But from, from reading your work, fed versus fasted cardio in women is not the straightforward conversation that it should be for men where there doesn't really seem to be any difference. Have I understood what you, you said correctly? Is there a big difference in women between exercising in a fasted state and a fed state? Absolutely. So it comes down to the hypothalamus. And in the hypothalamus, there's an area of neurons called kisspeptin or the kiss one gene. And this is a really essential group of neurons that is responsible for puberty development. So we're looking at endocrine system, thyroid, muscle development, that kind of stuff. In, the, in women, there are two areas of kisspeptin neurons, but in men, there's one. So we have two areas in the women because women have a menstrual cycle and a, a very robust endocrine system that changes over the course of a month. Men, they don't have that. So when we're looking at thresholds for calorie intake, we're looking at nutrient density, the thresholds are completely different. So we see that in women, when they start to drop their calories below 35 calories per kilogram of fat-free mass, the kisspeptin neurons are downregulated. So we start to see a downregulation of thyroid within even four days of this. We see a, a reduction in luteinizing hormone pulse, which then feeds forward into menstrual cycle dysfunction. For men, that threshold, when we start to see a little bit of endocrine dysfunction, like a little bit of lower testosterone, is 15 calories per kilogram fat-free mass. So there's a massive threshold difference. So when we start talking about fasted training, one, women are already maximally capable of burning fatty acids from sex differences within the muscle itself. Then we also have estrogen exposure that also encourages fatty acid utilization. So the idea of fasted training and the whole metabolic efficiency thing doesn't hold water for women. And when we start looking at women going into fasted training, especially in the morning when there's a, a higher elevation of cortisol already, and then they start trying to do either lifting or heavy cardio intensity, you're not going to be able to hit those intensities without overstressing the body. And then the body stays in this catabolic state. And when you're in that catabolic state, the brain perceives it as, oh, you know, there's not enough calories. I have to start really conserving. It doesn't mean a lot of food when I talk about a fed state. People think, oh, I have to get up and have a full breakfast before I go training. It's like, no, 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 no. If you're going to do strength training, then it's 15 grams of protein. So around, what, 100 calories, 80 to 100 calories of protein. And that's enough to get amino acids circulating to signal to the hypothalamus that there's some nutrition coming in. And then post-strength training, have your breakfast, right? Have a good dose of protein and some carbohydrate and have your breakfast. If you can do a lot of cardiovascular type work, then you want to have 30 grams of carbohydrate with that 15 grams of protein. Not a lot. So there's 120 and 80, so maybe 200 calories max that you have before. I often opt for a protein fortified cold brew with some sweetened oat or almond milk because then I'm getting some carbohydrates some protein, a little caffeine, boom, good to go. Then I have breakfast afterwards. So getting people to understand it doesn't mean a full meal but it does mean some nutrition coming in. So the hypothalamus is understanding that I'm not going to be doing this kind of stress without any kind of fuel. Then it also feeds forward to better um, EPOC or excessive post-oxygen consumption. So your metabolism stays elevated, better uh, signaling for adaptations. And it's also a way of, of um, reducing catabolism in the body, especially if you're having some food before and after then you're shutting the breakdown state and you get better adaptive responses, especially in women. For men, it's not the same because of that threshold in the hypothalamus. And we know from like a biological perspective that in times of low calorie, men would lean up and get fitter and stronger to go fight the beast to try to bring calories home. 
but women would get fatter and their menstrual cycle would stop because they needed to store calories and they couldn't reproduce because why would you reproduce when there aren't enough calories around to feed who was already there so is there ever any is there ever a case for for women to fed to train sorry in in a fasted state i'm thinking of those personal trainers who might have had success with male clients uh training them fasted maybe they've got a woman whose primary uh training objective is to lose fat so they would instantly go for for a fasted training approach there is there is there a difference if someone is trying to lose excessive amounts of weight or is the rule a blanket one you should always be be training in a fed state if you're female It's kind of blanket. You should always be training in a fed state. So if you're trying to lose excess body fat, there are two things to really focus on. We know that increasing protein intake without exercise can recomp the body over the course of three months. And this is hitting that, you know, one gram per pound or two grams per kilo. And if you're doing that regular doses, then it does facilitate body fat loss. The other thing is just a slight calorie reduction in the afternoon away from training or even, you know, a smaller dinner and no snack after dinner really goes far because you're working with your chronobiology and you're working by giving your body the fuel that it needs in the day to work with your, your pretty much your circadian rhythm and how your body responds to food. And then it's also giving your body the opportunity to really utilize body fat, why it, you're sleeping and why you're resting in the evening so that your body's still able to recover, but it has fuel from body fat. So the way that I get people to understand is you want to fuel for the stress at hand. For women, it's really essential. You're not a diesel engine. You can't ride on fumes. You actually need really good fuel to make change, to make adaptive responses work for you. For men, it's a different story because their engine is completely different. So okay. when we start getting that, then we see it happen. Uh, I, with relative uh, energy deficiency in sport, is, is this what, what it's all about? Fundamentally, it's such a, an interesting area and being looked at, I think probably specifically at men, but the implications are completely different for women then because of how our bodies run. Is this something that, again, that you're having to, constantly try and educate people that women respond very, very differently to low calories than men do. Yes. Yes. And then in the sporting world, getting people to understand that men also suffer from low energy availability, but the symptomology is different than women. So, so far, when we see all the symptomology of red ass, it's based on female data, which is different, right? So we're seeing like cardiovascular perturbations, gut perturbations, um, loss of menstrual cycle, mood disorders, those happen in men, but they um, are apparent in a different fashion. So the mood disorders are different. So men become more aggressive. Women become depressed. Cardiovascular aspects, women's um, low-density lipoproteins go up. Men's triglycerides go up. So we're starting to see some sex differences. But if you were to take the idea of men and low energy availability and look at their blood work compared to what the norm is for women, they're completely different. So really trying to educate that these are the things that happen to women in low energy availability. These are the things that happen to men in low energy availability. And we have to address them differently to get them out.